Thank you very much, Dr. Rowan, and uh, my thanks as well uh, to uh, Drs. Coleman and Leonard for the invitation and uh, for the honor of uh, presenting in the afternoon session in which uh, Joe Connors uh, has been honored. Uh, a highlight of my own career was a sabbatical year uh, with Joe's group in uh, Seattle, Lori Sen and uh, the rest of the group, Randy Gascoigne, it was really a, a highlight and, uh, and a very productive year. So what I'm gonna do is try to frame for you uh, where we are in mantle cell lymphoma with briefly going over current therapies for the biologic spectrum of disease and then how do we integrate some of the newer agents uh, into uh, uh, current treatment approaches. Uh, th these are my disclosures. So there are a number of challenges in mantle cell. Uh, first of all, even though it's a very specific subtype of non-Hodgkin lymphoma with a, a particular molecular marker, the 1114 translocation in virtually all cases, it nonetheless has a real uh, biologic and clinical spectrum. Uh, we need better treatment endpoints. Uh, some of that may be pet adapted, but probably better. Uh, and I'm not going to go into this a great deal today, are the use of uh, things like MRD to, uh, as a potential treatment endpoint. Um, we want to improve the duration of response since most patients will relapse uh, uh, with their disease. Uh, we need to optimize use of stem cell transplant, targeted agents, uh, reflecting Dr. Chesson's talk earlier today, moving toward uh, uh, chemo-free regimens by leveraging some of these newer agents is, uh, is a, a hope that we all have. And ultimately, since most patients with this disease are not cured, we would certainly like to improve uh, in that regard for these patients. So as everyone in this room knows, typically uh, this is a somewhat male-predominant subtype of uh, non-Hodgkin's. The average age is in the 60s. Uh, they usually present with advanced disease. Uh, MIPI scores, the mantle cell IPI, can correlate with outcome. Uh, but as Dr. Leonard said, with large cell, we don't really risk adapt therapy based on MIPI. Um, extranodal disease is common in this disease, in this uh, subtype, especially the GI tract. And we know there are uh, markers of more aggressive disease, typically those who present with the blastoid or blastic variant. Uh, complex karyotype, p53 mutation, uh, as well as an elevated uh, KI67 uh, proliferation marker above 30 percent. Pathogenesis, early on, the 1114 translocation uh, puts uh, immunoglobulin heavy chain promoters next to the cyclin D1 gene, leads to its overexpression, and then there's a cascade of other um, mutations that accumulate uh, as uh, the disease uh, progresses. It's important to recognize that there's an indolent subtype of uh, mantle cell, uh, and it can present clinically very much like CLL, splenomegaly, a leukemic phase, marrow involvement, but often very little, if any, nodal involvement. And these patients uh, with this phenotype of disease can have a very indolent course or over months or even years. Uh, and sometimes I see them in consultation because in general, mantle cell has a bad reputation. People see the leukemic phase, and it makes, you know, raises a concern that this is a particularly difficult subtype, but, uh, but uh, recognizing it can allow you to follow them. And there are some molecular markers uh, that, that characterize this as well, but typically it's a clinical diagnosis. So how do we manage this uh, disorder in uh, 2019? So for the subset of about 20% of patients with a very low burden of disease, uh, they have this indolent uh, phenotype presentation, they're asymptomatic, uh, as Peter Martin uh, published from the Cornell group some years ago. Uh, they can be followed, often for months, like I said, sometimes for years, without treatment. Uh, for younger, fit patients who need therapy, a current standard is to use a high-dose cytarabine-based regimen. Uh, the one that we prefer is uh, our DHAP, uh, where we, and for us, we substitute oxaliplatinum for cisplatinum. It's only four cycles, auto-transplant consolidation. And then in a study uh, that was in the New England Journal uh, in early 2017 by the French group, uh, if you do three years of maintenance therapy, there was uh, both an impressive progression-free and overall survival benefit for maintenance after uh, uh, auto-transplant. 
One of the questions is, and I'll address this in just a second, is, well, if you've already gotten a really deep response to your induction therapy, can you just go to maintenance and not do the high-dose therapy and a stem cell transplant? Uh, so that's an unknown as of now. And of course, it's not essential. There are, you can get good responses with other regimens without high-dose ARC. Uh, and so many will treat patients with BR or uh, one of the other regimens. Now, this is the current U.S. intergroup trial that's addressing the question of stem cell transplantation. Tim Fenske uh, with the ECOG uh, group is uh, running this. So here's the way it works, and this is an important one for each of you to keep in mind in your own practice. So a patient with, who's transplant eligible by age and fitness, who has newly diagnosed mantle cell needing treatment, you can use any induction therapy you wish. Um, uh, but at some point after diagnosis or treatment gets going, then you want to refer that patient to a center where the study is open. Uh, testing is done to see if they have a biomarker, a molecular marker for MRD testing. Uh, if they do not, they're not eligible to go on to the study. If they have an informative MRD marker, um, uh, then you're enrolled in the study. At the end of your induction therapy, MRD is reassessed. If you're MRD positive or by PET, you're still in just a partial remission, then you go to additional therapy potentially, but an auto transplant with retux maintenance. Now the experimental part here is that if you have achieved MRD negativity and you're in CR by PET uh, after induction, then you're randomized to an auto transplant and maintenance for three years or just maintenance. So this is trying to get at, again, question, questioning whether we can de-escalate therapy for people who have been very uh, chemoimmunosensitive uh, up front. Now what about older patients, non-transplant eligible? So there's a variety of, of regimens. I won't read them, but they're listed here. Um, uh, so you know, the challenge with mantle cell, or one of them, is you can get good responses to many different regimens. The challenge is keeping them in that remission. So that's why we're looking for deeper responses or maintenance approaches that will achieve that. And I'll talk in particular about the R-squared regimen that Dr. Ruan uh, uh, recently updated uh, in just a minute. So here's what we might expect. Now these, uh, with these standard regimens, if you will, uh, so these are uh, uh, patients who did not receive maintenance rituximab. And you can see the overall response rates, as I said, are quite good. They're in the 90% uh, range. Complete remissions, however, are about 50%. And you can see that the PFS, especially after our CHOP, is relatively short. For, 14 or 15 months. So they're, they're chemoimmunosensitive, but hard to keep them in a durable remission. Now this is, I think, a really important study, uh, Dr. Ruan's, that I just mentioned, for a variety of reasons. It's a, it's a you know, single agent, well, no, it was a multi-center study, wasn't it? Uh, so several centers contributed patients, 38. The overall response rate, this is frontline, 92% to lenalidomide and uh, rituximab. The three-year PFS, you can see, was 80% with overall survival of 90%. And uh, recently in JCO, I guess about a year ago, uh, she provided the five-year update with an estimated five-year PFS of 64%, overall survival 77%. And from a hypothesis-generating standpoint about where might we go if we want to look at non-cytotoxic regimens, so eight out of the 10 patients who remained in complete remission at three years were MRD negative. So it suggests you can get very deep remissions with this uh, doublet. Uh, toxicity is what you uh, might have expected. Those who relapsed still have an array of other treatment options available. So I think this is a very important um, uh, study as we think about how we might move forward in treating this. A somewhat of a version of that is the uh, ECOG intergroup trial uh, where uh, patients who were not transplant eligible were induced with bendamustine rituximab with or without bortezomib, and then they went to maintenance for two years with either rituximab or rituximab plus lenalidomide. And uh, this study, uh, led by Mitchell Smith, completed accrual actually three years ago. 
but as of our ECOG meeting 48 hours ago, uh, we're still only at 89% of the events needed to read out, so it's anticipated uh, that we'll have this data probably sometime in the spring. Uh, Dr. Smith is presenting the MRD data without relating it to individual arms at the uh, upcoming ASH meeting. So what about relapse disease? So younger, fit patients, it's important for those individuals if they are eligible for an aloe transplant, that's their curative option. You can cure people with an aloe transplant, not typically used in the frontline setting, however. Uh, for older, less fit patients, of course, as with any cancer we're treating, it depends what they've had before. We like to get them on study. There's a variety of active targeted agents, which I'll go through for you uh, now. So you've heard a lot about these agents. You're familiar with the B-cell receptor pathway, which is shown in simplified form here. But there are a variety of targetable agents or, or, or uh, enzymes, most, mostly tyrosine kinases, in this pathway. So fostimatinib, uh, the BTK inhibitors, the PI3 kinase inhibitors that you heard about this morning, mTOR inhibitors, uh, proteasome inhibitors, including the oral exazomib, uh, and uh, venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor. So there are lots of drugs that have single agent activity. The question is, how do we leverage these in combination with, with antibodies, with chemotherapy, with combination targeted drugs? That's where a lot of the effort is in the field right now. Here's a, a slide just to show the array of responses. You can see with BTK inhibitors, venetoclax, or the combination of ibrutinib venetoclax, uh, uh, high response rates, uh, uh, and uh, uh, most of them are maintaining those responses, at least with short follow-up. I'll go through with you some data on BTK inhibitors and venetoclax, just to sort of frame uh, where we are and what we might expect with those. In the uh, uh, relapse setting, this is a pooled analysis of three different ibrutinib studies in relapsed uh, mantle cell. And what it shows is PFS on the uh, left, overall survival on the right. And the two curves, the better looking curve, are those patients who had had only one prior line of therapy. Uh, so you can see they did significantly better than those who'd had two or more uh, lines. Now, acalabrutinib, as you know, is a next generation BTK inhibitor. It's FDA approved for mantle cell if they'd had a prior treatment. It's twice a day dosing. Uh, it's a more specific uh, BTK inhibitor, as you can see from these uh, plots at the bottom. And in the phase two study that uh, was published in Lancet a little over a year ago, you can see an impressive uh, response rate, uh, including complete responses uh, looking better than what we saw with ibrutinib. But if you compare these studies, they're not uh, the same patient populations. Uh, so compared with uh, the ibrutinib data that I just showed you, uh, you can see that um, the, uh, there were more patients with high MIPI scores, there were more patients with uh, prior stem cell transplant. So it, it does, <coughs> excuse me, it does appear that ACALA has a better safety profile. Uh, Atrial fibrillation is infrequent. Bruising, bleeding is less. You do have challenges with some patients with severe headache, especially in the first weeks of therapy. It seems to respond to um, uh, caffeine, so uh, uh, that can help uh, get patients through that period. Uh, we can't say that it's a more effective agent as yet than ibrutinib, um, but there is a study that has completed accrual, not yet reported, for high-risk CLL uh, of ibrutinib versus acala. So I think that'll give us a better sense of, of uh, how these might compare in terms of outcome and tolerability. There is a third BTK inhibitor that's in development, uh, xanabrutinib. It is in many ways a little more similar to acala in terms of its side effect profile. It's also a twice a day agent. At the Lugano meeting this year, uh, Professor Song uh, from Peking University presented the study of 86 patients. Um, I don't know how many of them had had prior uh, stem cell. And you can see here that um, 
about 10% of people came off due to toxicity. The response rate, 85%, a very high complete remission rate. Uh, and toxicity was, like I said, more similar to um, ACALA. Simple things to do to try to get better responses, higher CR rates with uh, a BTK or to put it with an antibody. Here's another Lugano study of 42 patients. They excluded the highest risk patients, blastoid, high KI-67. <coughs> um, and you can see that the CR rate, um, instead of being about uh, 40%, as we see with uh, ibrutinib, it was about 69%, including MRD negativity. So switching to venetoclax, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, so this is a BCL2 inhibitor that induces uh, uh, cells to undergo apoptosis. It's active across several types of uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We would have thought that follicular lymphoma, that this would be a home run drug. I mean, they're almost all BCL2 translocated with the 1418, they express BCL2, but it's a pretty modestly active drug in uh, follicular, but it turns out to be, have very good activity in mantle cell as well as CLL, which isn't shown here. If you look at the top, you can see the PFS and uh, overall survival for single agent venetoclax. It's important for those of you who've used it, you're aware of this, but this, this drug is, is uh, intensely potent for patients that have a high burden of disease, splenic, nodal, uh, circulating cells, any degree of renal insufficiency, you have to be very, very cautious about tumor lysis. And uh, there have been deaths from tumor lysis in the early development. So to mitigate that, you use this uh, ramp stepped up dosing 20, 50, 100 to get to the target, which is typically 400. Now, what about putting ibrutinib and venetoclax together? There have been two studies uh, in mantle cell uh, for that. This is the first, which was reported last year in uh, the New England Journal. So this study, relapsed refractory mantle cell, many of them prior stem cell transplant and relapse. They got a month of ibrutinib, 560 a day, standard dose for uh, mantle cell, and then in the second month they had that ramped up venetoclax dosing, uh, and then they proceeded with 400 milligrams, and they stayed on both drugs uh, until toxicity or progression. Only 24 patients, but if you look at MRD uh, in the peripheral blood on the far right, you can see that some patients basically didn't respond well in terms of clearing all their disease, <coughs> and if you read down the left side here, Again, 24 patients, 71% response uh, uh, CR by PET scan. There were three non-responders even to this combination, and we have some insights now into why that resistance, how it's mediated. Progression-free survival is shown on the top. This is the other study in uh, mantle cell. So this was uh, uh, developed um, at our center from uh, some translational work looking at uh, mantle cell, uh, cell lines and, pa and uh, patient samples uh, that also showed synergy. The strategy my colleague, Dr. Craig Portel, uh, used in putting the study together was to start with venetoclax, <coughs> excuse me, get patients to 100 milligrams, and then we add in varying doses of ibrutinib. And that will be reported at uh, ASH this year. <coughs> Sorry. The, uh, there's a, an international study going on now of this combination called Sympatico. Uh, some of you may be taking part in that, where it's ibrutinib venetoclax versus ibrut placebo. So there's been a lot happening in mantle cell. We've learned a lot about targeted agents uh, in this disease. Uh, we clearly have a long way to go, but I think as we understand the disease better, we'll have more rational approaches uh, to it. We know that there are certain bad actor subtypes, including those with p53 mutation, who are likely to fail uh, standard therapies, including autotransplant. Maintenance therapies and stem cell transplant itself, we may be able to apply uh, in a risk-adapted fashion by using MRD testing. Um, and you know, the future right now, there are lots of studies going on. Uh, looking at combining targeted agents, uh, minimizing standard chemo and transplant, and uh, 
and to limit the duration of therapy, perhaps by uh, very effective combinations of targeted drugs. So again, my thanks for the invitation.